This time we call our Natural Resource Committee meeting uh, to order. Uh, if you would, please join me at this time to say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before I ask the clerk to call the roll, uh, I actually would like to take a moment for us to introduce one of our, our newest members that we have on Natural Resources, and we'd like to welcome Cassie Armstrong Chambers to Natural Resources. Cassie, would you like to make a few comments this morning as we get started? Uh, no, I just uh, thank you for the welcome. I'm excited to be here and excited to work with you all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, very good. And before we do roll, do we have any of our members that have any special guests that you'd like to recognize or any special comments or announcements? Okay, seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Senator Chambers Armstrong. Yes. Senator Carpenter. Senator Mills. I'm here. Senator Schickel. Senator Southworth. Here. Senator Webb. Here. Senator Westerfield. Here. Senator Wheeler. Here. Senator Williams. Here. Senator Turner. And Chair Smith. Here. A quorum? All right, we do have a quorum. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask, uh, we'll stick to the order of it, um, to have Senate Bill 281. Senator Howe, if you want to go ahead and come to the table, uh, bring any guests you've got. And if you don't mind, once you get to the table, be sure your mics are on and then identify yourself for your guests for our records, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hey, uh, Senator Howe, before you uh, get started, if you don't mind, there's a substitute for it. So let's go ahead and have a motion to adopt the substitute. Do you have a motion? Second. Motion and second for your substitute. It's very popular up here. All those in favor of the sign of aye. Aye. Opposed, likewise. Go ahead. Now we'll be speaking to the substitute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, uh, Jason Howe, Senate District 1. I'm Tom Underwood. I'm uh, representing Continental Refining Company. So, Mr. Chairman, um, Ten years ago when you and uh, Senator Webb and some others were here, you guys passed a, a mandate to de for Finance Cabinet to develop a strategy on how to uh, transition state fleets to alternative fuels. And uh, you tasked them with creating a, a plan to do this. And uh, in 2021, they finally got around to uh, working through that plan. Apparently, it was a lot more difficult than any of you guys had anticipated at the time. But uh, uh, and now we need to go in and uh, require some implementation of this plan. We have a lot of alternative fuel vehicles that aren't using alternative fuel, and, and this is something we can do to address that part of it. It, it supports many missions in this, but uh, but most especially our corn and soybean producers and other uh, alternative fuel producers uh, that work through ethanol and biodiesel in the state. And uh, if, if we're going to act we have a motion and a second. Do you want to continue or you want to go ahead and take your <laughs> I am good. I would I would never try to talk over Senator Wheeler. <laughs> Very good. Uh, we think we do have uh let's see, do we have anybody who wants to speak on this particular bill? All right, we do not. So at this time I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Senator Chambers Armstrong. Aye. Senator Carpenter. Senator Mills. Aye. Senator Schickel. Aye. Senator Southworth. Aye. Senator Turner. Aye. Senator Webb. Senator Westerfield, aye. Senator Wheeler, aye. Senator Williams, aye. Chair Smith. I vote aye. And so Motion uh, for Senate consent. Bill 281 with committee substitute with the expression at the same shall pass. Okay, you got your bill out of here. We will wait for that to come to the floor because I think there will be some oh, discussion okay. on that once we get there. Okay. I'm fine with consent. Or we'll handle it however you want. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, actually, we have a motion for consent. Well, we have a motion for consent and a second, then we'll go ahead and, and put that on consent then. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of the sign of aye? Aye. Opposed likewise? We have a consent. And I wanted to say, uh, I remember Senator Lindy Casebeer, uh was a was the first person I remember talking about this in my, my tenure here, and he was a very big proponent about wanting to get that done. And you're right, it's been far, far too long to be waiting around for this to be implemented. So thanks for taking action on it, and we'll see where this thing goes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank Members of the committee, thank you. Excuse me, uh, for discussion only. This is a big bill, so we, fortunately we've got plenty of time left 
uh, in our uh, meeting today to have it. So if you would like to, uh, go, Senator uh, from Meyer, go ahead and come to the table with anyone you have with you that like to speak. And uh, please uh, ask any of your guests to identify themselves for our records. Thank you, Chairman Smith, and thank you, committee. Uh, I've got, my name is Shelley Funky from Iyer. I'm Senate District 24, which is all of Camel, Pendleton, Bracken, and a slice of Kenton County. Um, and we are rich in natural resources in that area too. Um, and then we've got a special guest. He'll be able to go into some detail for us. So I'll let him introduce himself when he's ready to speak. But Senate Bill 245 is, um, I get very excited about economic development. And what I recognize that we're trying to achieve with Senate Bill 245 is reliable, affordable, and in fact, a stable relative to regulations, but energy policy for Kentucky. And where I'm hopeful that you can provide us uh, your input as well, we recognize we're going to really work on this in the interim. So we'll be eager to hear from you. But relative to the recognition, wind and solar, those might serve Kentucky at peak moments in time, but that's not going to be our base source. We've got such a treasure of coal, and we, we want to continue to recognize that. But we've also got some efforts towards the nuclear task force, and that is going to be a real value to recognize um, we're under pressure. The federal government has given us to 2030. That's not enough time, um, but we know that that is the time frame. What I want to acknowledge, 245 is meant to be a 10, 20, 30, but really a 50-year plan. And I want you to imagine that we've got a dartboard and the center of that board is a smart energy policy. And if we're going to recognize that each dart is some sort of an energy source um, and, and we're all going to work together and be throwing darts towards this to try to achieve a smart energy policy in Kentucky. But we need some tools to do that. So that's where the securitization element of Senate Bill 245 does come in because we need a bridge, um, but we also need the affordability aspect. So this helps us to bridge towards the affordability and then the reliability is let's let's bring all of the potential sources of energy, coal front and center being one of those sources. Um, so on that note, um, my hope is that as we move towards the interim, we'll be able to start to address multiple sources of energy. Senator Will, are you wishing to be recognized? Oh, I'll ask that Is it relative to the statements that were made? If you want to go ahead and make it now, we'll go ahead and do it now. I guess, uh, has the Coal Association endorsed uh, this particular bill? Senator Wheeler asking if the Coal Association has endorsed. We have not. I have not myself reached out, nor have they reached out to me, but we'll be eager to work with them. Okay. Um, I Wait, Mr. Chairman, I had a follow-up, but I'll wait till the other testimony is concluded. Thank you. All right, very good. Go ahead and continue. Okay. And, and I, I would just, um, I'll, I'll be taking notes from here forward, and I appreciate that question, Senator Wheeler. Um, and I'd like to turn it over to the expert joining me. Excellent. Thank you, Senator, and thanks, uh, thanks everybody, for giving me uh, an opportunity to, to speak for a minute. Um, uh, a few minutes, and I'll try to make it brief because we're talking about some fun financial tools. But um, my name is Brad Viator. Um, I, uh, I guess historically for 11 years or so, ran external affairs for the Edison Electric Institute, which is the trade association for all the investor-owned utilities. 
I am here as uh, the witness for the investor-owned utilities uh, here in the uh, Commonwealth, almost said state, sorry, uh, of, of Kentucky. Um, and my expertise is in and around the business and uh, business model of utilities. That's what I where I focus my attention. Uh, testified uh, on securitization uh, in a number of different jurisdictions all across uh, the country. So can kind of answer questions uh, as we get into it more about how other places uh, have, have utilized this tool. Um, I'm a pretty frequent contributor to policy conversations at all the national organizations. The Alex, I'm speaking at a webinar for Alec next week, um, uh, NCSL, uh, the Governor's Associations, et cetera. So this is um, one of the things that I uh, spend my time on. Here's just a little bit of an outline of what I plan to talk about. Don't be overwhelmed by the fact that there are eight points. I will, uh, I will try to uh, do it, do it quickly because keeping uh, everybody awake is uh, certainly a priority. Um, to kick everything off, I think there's just one important thing that needs to be said about investor-owned utilities and why they are granted the monopoly status that they are granted within their service area. And the reason really is, it goes back to this uh, this court case, the Binghamton Bridge Supreme Court case of 1865, which essentially says, uh, the quote there is pretty good, if you embark your time, money, and skill in an enterprise which will accommodate the public necessity, we will grant to you for a limited time period or perpetuity privileges that will justify the expenditure of your money and the employment of your time and skill. The regulatory compact, to put it simply and more straightforward, is the original public-private partnership. Investments in these infrastructure, in the infrastructure that we need to operate our electric system, is very expensive, and so we like to capitalize on the fact that there are private investors that are willing to pay that money at a moment in time when it's needed, and then you sort of carry those costs over an extended period of time or, or amortization schedule. So what is security? Uh, what is securitization? So when you go in and say you build an asset or when a storm comes through and you have uh, a ton of damage that is sustained, but it, for this purpose, we'll talk about the construction of an asset. When you go in and build an asset, you decide that you're making a commitment with the utility for 40 years. They are going to pay the money up front to build that asset, and they will get paid back by customers over the course of, say, 40 years. Well, sometimes something will come into play that will make that asset too expensive to operate, whether it's federal regulation or whatever. We've seen a lot of that around here. And so you are beginning to evaluate an asset, and you're saying, look, I know we made a commitment to operate this thing and to pay this thing back for 40 years, but we would rather um, close that asset and replace it with something else because the cost to continue to operate it are simply too high. At that moment in time, if the Public Service Commission has the ability to securitize that asset, what they would be able to do is essentially, at right then, save customers money. So say we're 32 years into a 40-year asset. There's still eight years left that needs to be paid back. We are essentially bankrupting that asset at the moment in time, attaching a bond to it, and that um, and taking the earnings from the utility out of that um, out of that asset. So the utilities were supposed to get their money paid back over the next eight years, uh, but they are going to forego that. They're going to forego the seven to nine percent earnings that were attached to it for the remaining eight years. That asset is going to be owned by bondholders. It will no longer be owned by the utility. That is, in effect, what securitization is. It is bankrupting an asset just like you would bankrupt anything else, and you are going through it and figuring out what has to be paid. And one of the things that gets removed from that payment is the return on equity to the utility. So I think it's important when we talk about what securitization is to make sure that I'm double underlining the fact that the utilities are foregoing the sort of revenues they were promised when they went through a just and reasonable adjudicatory process to build that plan in the first place. So 
it is a novel trend that we're seeing uh, utilities start to come to the table and suggest securitization as a vehicle going forward to solve the energy needs of their state. So I think that that, that needs to be um, stated outright. Um, <clears throat> a bunch of states are doing this. Uh, we're, we're really seeing this trend uh, accelerate, and they're doing it for a couple of, uh, in a couple different categories. Stranded assets, um, you know, you're, you're, you're seeing it. COVID costs is another one that we saw, uh, which is uh, in, the, in the California context. But, um, you know, you're seeing it for stranded assets, so it might not be, uh, it, it could be on uh, nuclear investment. We've actually seen quite a few of those. You're seeing it around uh, coal retirements. You're seeing it on storm costs. And then other, in the other category, one of the things that we're seeing is um, a lot of states are starting to securitize fuel costs. You might remember there was a big winter storm in Texas where 700 people died in February of 2021, where the electric system collapsed and natural gas price, prices shot through the roof. Some of the costs that came out of that, uh, those natural gas costs in particular states, it might be two, three, four billion dollars for a month of use. And so people would attach the securitization tool to those types of things so that we can sort of carry forward the cost to customers so they don't have this exorbitant rate shock. So a lot of states are, are digging into this. How does securitization benefit customers? It costs them, I mean, they save money. The, the, the long and short of it is they save money. A uh, decision's been made that, uh, you know, an asset is uh, no longer going to be utilized and it's closed. Well, instead of just closing it and carrying that cost on the bill for the next eight years, You'll build a security, get rid of it from uh, the utility sort of like ownership at that point, and carry those costs forward for Dude, I, I may years. Ask, make one point here. I, yes, sir. I, I don't necessarily know that they save money uh, because I think what you're seeing is the utilities, and correct me if I'm wrong, are reacting to some sort of a federal policy change that's now punishing them if they're using fossil fuels, for example. And so now... If you look at the plant with all the emissions litigation and look at the plant with them closing the 2015 loophole on ash mm -hmm. and all the money it's going to cost, uh, then it's going to be too expensive to use something that without those would be very affordable, which right. we all know. But So even though you do spread out uh, the cost for it, what's going to be replaced with, with the renewable that's still, which we've seen, uh, it's probably going to be another seven to ten cents more expensive per kilowatt hour than what they're paying for with what they had. So the, really, the rate payer, the, the hidden part of all of this, uh, that is the, the direct um, end result of bad policy uh, from the federal level, is that this rate payer now is going to be punished because the policy is 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 making them pay for something that they don't even get to use the benefit of anymore because that takes away the reliability, and that's why you had those deaths. Uh, and now they're going to be forced to purchase something that's not ready or fully uh, applicable to what they need. Not good, bad, or indifferent. Not, it's not saying that it won't be. But right now we're seeing those costs are significantly higher. And so I, I do think that in, in full uh, transparency that it's not cheaper for the ratepayer. They will actually wind up paying at the least seven cents more per kilowatt hour in this model. If um I, I, I'll, if I could speak to that just please, for, for a moment. Um, look, I think you make some good points. When we think about the utility finance, we think about, okay, I've got these rules from the EPA that tell me I've got to install this scrubber. And if I'm going to go out and install a scrubber on a coal plant, for example, it might cost me $350 million, right? i got to spend $350 million on an asset that's got eight years left, and I've got to socialize that cost, right? And so I make a consideration of, okay, $350 million more, on an asset that has an eight-year useful life, uh, you know, to go forward, maybe we could carry it out a little bit further, but that's sort of how you think about it. Or I could say, well, for $450 million, I could build a gas plant and I could sort of operate that uh, going forward. I think the renewable piece, practically speaking, is, you know, in a lot of these, in a lot of these places, Kentucky's certainly one of them, is it's helpful around the edges it is not baseload power and it is not the thing that you're replacing those assets with. And I think one of the reasons I'm glad y'all are taking this multi-year approach to it is this bill also talks about those investments in other sort of baseload generation, whether it's a conversation about renewable natural gas, whether it's a conversation about nuclear. Frankly, I think there's room for discussion about 
how um, you know some natural gas can be utilized to replace this capacity. As a practical matter, I think that's the conversation that um, that, that I'm, I'm happy you all are having because you're thinking about, all right, look, I'm going to replace this important baseload for the next 40 years, and I'm not just going to do it with wind and solar that's just going to show up when the sun's shining and the wind's blowing. I'm going to do it with something that's going to be there all the time. And I think that's why we're hopeful that this two-year conversation where stakeholders are invited in will result in a conclusion where you're making thoughtful you know, choices for the future of the Commonwealth. Well, we'll see how that plays out with gas, <laughs> but uh, I do have a couple of comments here. We'll go ahead and take this time. Senator Wheeler, I'll go ahead and let you ask your comment. Thank you. Um, I, I guess one question I had, I mean, is bankruptcy really a fair comparison because the utility is actually getting made whole when they securitize an mm -hmm. asset, are they not? They're getting their capital back, and mm -hmm. it's more like paying off a car early, is it not? I mean, you are in – a lot of ways, the, the question kind of becomes, what's the utility to that asset once we are securitizing? So if it's not operating yeah. any longer, if that's the conversation that's being had about no longer operating it, I think it's um, uh, that that just be the only point I make. But there is some discussion about paying it off early, yes. But if I'm not using the asset, that's that's sort of why oh, the analogy is done that way. And then, you know, for my own example in my own <laughs> utility service area, KU, where they, uh, you know, decommissioned the Big Sandy coal plant, mm -hmm. you know, and there's still a surcharge on mm -hmm. that bill. Uh, and, you know, there's also a lack or a, a problem with generation, I think, in, in that area as well, that there's going to have to be some um, – you know, replacement in the in the in the right. near future. Does that not kind of uh, really stick it to the rate payer when you're having them pay for the regulatory asset while at the same time uh, paying for new generation? I think that's what operating the electric system. That's how operating the electric system is going to work. We've got to ensure that we have assets to serve customer needs. And as a practical matter, it's you know, you're retiring it a little bit early. That's true, right? So five, six, seven, eight years of cost where you don't get to benefit from the value of that asset, it is something that can become problematic. But we're taking the earnings component out of it. So we're reducing the cost of that thing when we're, when we're making the decision, whether we were put there because of federal overreach, which required investment in a scrubber, which didn't make economic sense yeah. or not. That's sort of how we... Um, you know, get to where we are. It's it's not a, yeah. it is not a, it is not the rosiest picture when the federal government puts yeah. um, uh, these sort of constraints on system that lead us to a retirement discussion. That is not the optimal goal, and there are costs that are in it. But we're trying to make those costs as Follow up small as possible. May, Mr. Chairman, yes, I mean, why, why should we, you know, incentivize retirements of like. Uh, you know, our fossil power plants that are very stable generation when we've seen, you know, what the end result of that can be with some of the brownouts and, and that we saw last December, which in, you know, I don't think we've ever seen anything like that in Kentucky before, which, you know, I think is a direct result of a, you know, a, um, a rush to get to some type of green utopia that uh, simply we're not technologically in a position to, uh, to get to just yet and, and and you know really it places lives at risk i mean you have people at home on uh you know heart monitors we have people with cpap machines we have people with you know home dialysis on occasion that are very dependent on on a stable reliable electric grid and you know are we not essentially rushing towards a um or putting people's lives at risk by rushing forward uh on this uh really um irresponsible energy policy that's being promulgated out of Washington. My question is when you uh, when, when you made the point about um, uh, incentivizing, what, what, what incentive are you referencing, incentivizing well, the utility on closure? Well, I'm, I'm talking about when you make the decision to, um, you know, essentially allow them to replace mm. reliable generation with uh, uh, by, by, by using securitization essentially as a sword to allow them to retire fossil plants early so that they can replace it with less reliable generation that is often subsidized by the 
federal government through, mm-hmm. uh, you know, well, subsidies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you know, is that not uh, placing um, the grid at risk in some situations and reliable electric service? My, my response would be, which is why this bill is looking at nuclear, and I think there's room to have conversations mm-hmm. about natural gas mm-hmm. and renewable natural gas in this discussion as well, because if not, if that directive isn't given to the Public Service Commission to sort of figure out what that replacement looks like, those decisions might be made in a different way where the, this this generation is replaced with renewables or other resources that are not in position to manage it. So I actually think this is a discussion about your body and the legislature writ large making some determinations about what you want new generation investments to be. And well, one more point, Mr. Chairman. I mean, but isn't the purpose of the PSC to ensure the lowest cost alternative to the rate payer? Isn't that their goal to make sure that not only do the utilities get a fair recovery, but that it's also the, the, the best cost recovery? And sometimes what you're talking about, as I think Senator Smith, or Chairman Smith, uh, stated, is absolutely not the lowest cost alternative to the rate payer. That it, look, it's absolutely true that the uh, Public Service Commission is going to make a discussion about how to do things at least cost. That is that is absolutely true. And we want them to do that, don't we? Of course we do. Okay. That's yeah. exactly what it's exactly what we're looking for. But we want to think about what what we want the future generation in the Commonwealth to be. And thinking about, all right, are there some resources out there? Are there some incentives that we should be utilizing to explore what the next forty or fifty years of generation is going to be going for. And when you say incentives, are you essentially talking about federal subsidies, which, I mean, I consider a form of corporate welfare? There are some incentives that are organized that I t- way. i tell you what, at this time, I'm going to maybe okay, take back sorry. my for a second. That's okay. Uh, we just have a, a lot of members that have questions and stuff. Sure. And so since we do have a new member on board, uh, when we're asking questions, uh, if you have to do a follow-up, <coughs> always go through the chair. That way we are in, in respect yeah. to... Well, we get a line of a lot of people that uh, have thoughts, and we want to make sure that everybody gets the courtesy to be able to ask their questions. And sometimes we run out and don't always get to do that. So just to, to follow up with a question, just come back to the chair, and, and we'll always grant you that unless we're running into a time issue, which is what I'm running into right now. I have uh, <laughs> Senator Williams has a question he would like to ask. Thank you, Mr. Uh, chair. Um, so I'm looking at your 150 immediately for this six-year period versus 150 over 10 years, which doesn't seem like that big of a deal. But just like uh, bad federal policy is ending uh, low cost power, I think we have bad federal policy that is ending low cost borrowing as well. And even if you take out the earnings from that 150 million, it seems to me that the borrowing costs, these bondholders aren't doing this out of the goodness of their heart. Uh, the borrowing cost may actually increase that 150 mm-hmm. more so than the offset of just going from six to 10 year payback. And so how do you, so I'm not sure that I actually believe that it's the same amount of money over 10 years as over six years. I think likely where our borrowing costs are going, it's going to be much higher. I, I actually agree with you. I think what we'll end up doing on these bigger asset values when you're saying 250, $300 million dollars. I think the bonds are going to be more in the 30 year range. So when you stack interest in it, sure, it's going to cost more, but you're paying it over 30 years as opposed to paying it in as opposed to paying it over a, you know, 8 year period of time. It's going to be a bigger sort of slug on the bill. That's kind of how the savings but, sort of works out for a customer so you don't have a, you know, $20 rate shock. But like it's that. still a long it's more money being paid by rate payers just over a long period of time. Over a long period of time, that's right. Okay, thank you. Yep. And then we have... Uh, yeah, I'm, Senator Williams kind of hit on something that I was thinking about uh, from a forecasting budgetary aspect, mm-hmm. and I think it's uh, relative and I think it's a concern. Uh, just for the record, y- your firm's a lobbying firm, is that correct? No, I don't, okay. I don't lobby. I'm not registered to lobby. I'm oh. a policy expert oh you're a policy expert okay mm-hmm. well uh, so are, are it, but you your prior life was with uh with who edison electric institute of trade and, and, association and what are they they're trade association for all the investor and electric companies they certainly lobby i don't lobby okay but they're an investor lobbying firm 
uh, investor association. And they have clients here in Kentucky. They do. And, and who who are they? They're the three investor and uh, electric companies. Who's who? Who is who? I'm representing here as well. So who are? Would you name them, please? Sure. Uh, LGE, KU, Kentucky Power, uh, and Duke. So you're representing them here today. Yep. Okay, as a policy expert. Mm-hmm. Okay, I, I just um, good about building a record. I think we need to know exactly who we're talking to. But uh, thank you, Absolutely. Mr. Chairman. Absolutely. Very good. And Senator Turner. And then after that, we're going to go turn it back over to you to continue. Program. Great. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you. I don't know who needs to answer this question. Um, maybe she wants to. Either one of you. Uh, it, it's got shall in here a lot about the commission shall not do. Uh, has the commission been involved in this in any way, reviewed it or participated, made any suggestions or talked about it any? To your knowledge, either one of you? I, I do not have knowledge of commission conversations because it's got they shall not exercise its powers carrying out its duties regarding the matter with the, within the authority and it's got these listed mm-hmm. i mean i got a law degree and accounting degree and this thing is about 50 pages long and i reviewed it and it's you got to have a brain to go from one place back to another to see what's really happening then it goes to the customer bills electric obtain financing shall and it's got what how that's going to be designated the surcharges and then it says it can be assigned, so that means it's sold to somebody. Uh, and it even uses the word about collection. Uh, Fair of the utility comply with the provisions of this section shall not invalidate or impair. So it's got all these protective orders in there, and I don't in it want to know if anybody has scrutinized those from the other side, as we would say, such as the commission or any agency that's representing to help us as legislators do you all know if that this has been presented to anybody senator turner um in the process of better understanding um what was done during the interim and even in the last session because this isn't necessarily a new idea but it was brought forward and then a lot of work done in the interim but we know that there's more work to be done going forward um, but it was addressed, and we know that we need to dig in deeper. So thank you for bringing up those concerns, and we'll continue to uh, come back to you with answers. So one more, Mr. Chairman. So do I understand, then, this is just basically to make us aware of what's going on and put us on notice that uh, we've got to do a lot of work to work with this bill? Yes, All and right. we know that we need to do a lot of work to uh, – Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Get That's to all. the table. Okay, and listen, we've got we're 20 minutes out, and we're just simply going to run out of time. And we have people that have signed up to speak, and we definitely want them to hear it. Uh, I want to, to yield as much time as I can to you because I've gone through your presentation, and and not all of us up here are attorneys or have been familiar with this. And I think what you have done is is, is done a very good job of breaking down a big issue. Uh, and I think it benefit a lot of the members on this uh, committee that are not as familiar with this, that live this in and out as we do. So I'm going to try to yield back to you to cover as much of it as you can until I run out of time. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Senator Mills, if you could, I think you're up next. Okay, very good. Then please, please go right ahead. Great. Um, the, we kind of made this point a moment ago. How does securitization impact the utilities' bottom line? Generating facilities, in particular, are contracts with the utility owners over a defined number of years. Uh-huh with return on equity sort of recovered on a uh, going forward basis. Securitizing the closure of those facilities eliminates or reduces that return on equity. So it's it's a hit. It's a significant hit to the owner of these assets when, uh, when securitization occurs. But the benefit to it, uh, oh, how do I go back? Uh, the benefit to it is that it reduces customer costs. Now, the utility um, I think is in position where it is willing to, you know, engage in conversation about securitization and foregoing earnings that are uh, sort of signed into contract through regulatory compact and adjudicatory process in exchange for making a decision about building new assets. And so that is the thing about this piece of legislation that is more comprehensive than um, a lot of other pieces of legislation because it talks about securitization and the tool that can be utilized to save uh, customers money due to, as Senator Smith said, uh, regulations that are coming out of the federal government and are placing pressure on these assets. So 
uh, you know, there are certainly costs that are associated with it, but it reduces the costs on that asset as, uh, you know, it, once someone has made a decision to march toward closure. Uh, but it is it is novel because it also adds in the other things that, uh, you know, we should think about making investments in. There's the room to securitize uh, storm costs, et cetera. So capital recycling is the thing that makes securitization work for utilities books. Because practical matter, investors look at it and they go, okay, you were supposed to make this money over 40 years, you were supposed to make eight more years of earnings, and all that stuff evaporated. So so their cost of capital doesn't increase, so it doesn't become harder and harder for these utilities to continue to make investments. Capital recycling uh, allows them to go back to their shareholders and say, look, yeah, we gave up, there was a, a loss on this bill due to federal regulation, et cetera. Uh, we use a securitization tool, which sort of zeroed out uh, our earnings on a going forward basis. But it's okay because there's a new asset that's got 40 years more of life that we're thinking about now, and they can have a sort of reasonable conversation with investors about that. Um, what does the bill do? Uh, it gives the authority to the commission to just and reasonably use securitization to reduce consumer costs on assets that are required, uh, they're retired prior to the end of their amortization schedule. Um, you can also do it on storm costs or other deferred costs. And it's extraordinary. The number is uh, $150 million. So, uh, so, you know, once you're talking about storm costs, we're talking about big storms or uh, other sort of issues like that. Um, it also, as we said a little bit ago, and I think this is kind of the novel part, where it talks about investment in uh, renewable, renewable natural gas infrastructure, investment in nuclear energy, there's this other component that sits here where 75% of renewable generation in Kentucky will be owned by the utilities. The thing that I think is kind of interesting about that as a construct is that by saying 75% of the generation is going to be owned by utilities and the commission sort of designated what can be approved, you're in effect defining what the amount of renewable generation can be within the state by only allowing that 25 percent k uh that 25 percent on the margin i think that is essentially defining what the renewable story is going to be the utilities are going to build uh whatever the commission tells them to build and then that remaining uh 25 percent is sort of all that we have capacity for which is i think an important conversation as you think about land use and some of the other challenges that we're seeing in and around renewables. And then there's this other piece, which expands the length of qualified ordinary investment in transmission from one mile to 10 miles. More transmission investment is necessary. We think that ordinary maintenance should be more than a mile. There's just a lot of that stuff, a lot of upgrades that are necessary. So that's kind of a small change that sits in it. Um, this to me is the double bottom line. It's taking a comprehensive approach um, and looking forward as to what resources we want to make 30 or 40 year investments in. And it's a multi-session conversation. This is, you know, an informational conversation. Here's what the bill looks like. We're thinking we're going to come back. There are going to be a bunch of stakeholder conversations where the yeas and the nays are going to get in a room and we're going to have a conversation about matching supply and demand. And that's really what this energy discussion is about. You know, what is demand going to be? How do we focus on sort of economic development to recruit businesses into the state so they're making a decision to choose Kentucky over Texas or California or whatever? Energy costs are kind of a big part of that. And I think having a stakeholder discussion where we're talking about what we want our new resources to be is, uh, and talking about supply and demand, is a very useful way to figure out, you know, the, the future we're, um, we're going to build. Um, kind of the same point said, uh, said differently. Uh, last thing I'll say, I guess, about um, securization is that, you know, these utility balance sheets can't afford to do this, like, all over the place, right? Like, if you start, if these assets are securitized kind of all over the place, they're going to go back to their investors. Investors are going to be like, what the heck? You were in these contracts. You were supposed to make X number of dollars. That's why my pension fund invested in you. If there's all this securitization sort of blood on that balance sheet, it is going to be very difficult for them to raise capital going forward. So it is not in 
the utility's best interest or really the state's best interest to be applying this all over the place. Mm -hmm. It is in the best interest to apply it very narrowly in instances where there's exorbitant costs. And we frankly don't want to see these big bills sitting on customers, sitting on customers' bills for assets that they can no longer utilize. I mean, that that's kind of the the double bottom line. It's not a panacea. It is um, it can be problematic for the utility, but if we go out and pick a couple of places where we really want to lessen the burden for customers because we're talking about exorbitant costs and we can think about what we want that energy future investment to look like, it can be a useful tool, um, but it's, you know, it's not going to solve every problem. It's not a panacea by any means. Very good, Brad. Thank you. At this time, I'm going to let uh, Tom Fitzgerald. Tom, you want to go ahead and come up to the uh, the table there, and uh, we'll go ahead and let you have your comments and save some time. I have a couple of members that also have questions as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Tom Fitzgerald. Thanks, uh, uh, yeah. uh, direct, uh, formerly director of the Kentucky Resources Council. Now. I am of council and heading towards retirement eventually. I appreciate Senator Funky Frogmeyer bringing the bill. It was uh, good to finally meet her uh, this morning. I uh, mentioned to her one of my earliest uh, issues working as a essentially a legal aid attorney with KRC was trying to stop the Callensville Dam up in Pendleton County, which would have flooded some farmland. I had some farmers who were not thrilled about the idea of being underwater. And, and uh, so Pendleton County is near and dear to my heart. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I appreciate this opportunity to share our serious concerns about other aspects of this bill. Uh, properly uh, structured, and we have lots of states that we can look to and lots of best practices we can look to, securitization of debt is a way of lowering the cost of that debt to ratepayers and can be a benefit. Uh, to your point, Mr. Chairman, it, it's not going to lower the overall bill, but it may blunt some of the costs of retiring some of the debt by accessing longer term, lower cost debt because you're essentially bonding uh, that debt rather than having to rely on short term debt market. Um, I want to talk to you about the other issues, though, because whenever we approach these issues, as many of you know, KRC and I am particularly sensitive to getting it right when we change the signals to the utilities and change the signals to the commission, because we literally cannot afford to get it wrong. I work and have worked for 43 years now at the intersection of poverty and pollution, and we are being the fourth poorest state in the nation per capita. We cannot afford changes that will hurt either our most vulnerable ratepayers who are paying more than 20 percent of their income just to keep the lights on and stay warm in the winter, or the major companies that we rely on for employment, the steel industry, the aluminum industry, the car and truck industry, that are very dependent on changes in the uh, cost of electricity. In my 43 years of practicing law, I have never come across a ratepayer who wants less Public Service Commission scrutiny, to your question, Senator Turner, or wants less uh, scrutiny or accountability of the utilities that provide the essential services. Yet this bill would do just that, and that is why I have grave concerns regarding the bill. It would allow significant expenditures of significant capital projects with little or no PSC scrutiny. It undercuts utility regulation principles of demonstrating need and the absence of wasteful duplication for capital investments, which are the hallmarks of a certificate for public convenience and necessity. It eliminates the principles of reasonable lease cost planning for uh, nuclear and non-traditional gas projects and instead turns ratepayers into the financial lending institutions, assuming the costs and the financial risks of nuclear and other non-traditional energy projects, which may never come to fruition. Um, in the interest of time, Mr. Chairman, I'm not going to go into great detail. I will provide uh, the, the written comments to the members of the committee, and I look forward to this conversation moving forward. But I wanted to, uh, to just make clear some of the concerns starting this conversation. Uh, regarding the, uh, the, the uh, securitization process, the one concern I did have in what is drafted is that it subjects the advisors to the Public Service Commission 
to discovery and cross-examination. And that, to me, is very unprecedented. It is similar to asking a judge to make their law clerk available for cross-examination and depositions. And I think it's not an appropriate and is a somewhat intrusive suggestion. Um, Regarding Section 21 of the bill, it allows all reasonable expenses incurred by a utility for obtaining a permit from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for a nuclear power plant. Our principle has always been you recover only what is used and useful, and the cost recovery is based on an asset that is put into use for the ratepayers. This would allow cost recovery without consideration of least cost principles for preliminary steps in a process for a plant that may never be constructed. That is a dramatic change from the least cost planning, and I don't think it's appropriate to ask ratepayers to be the ones to assume the financial risk of a nuclear project not going forward. Section 23 is of concern because it says that the utilities shall own 75% of the renewable capacity in the state. That, to me, is an amazing overreach. Uh, they can own 100% of what they build, but for to suggest that they get to, there's somehow a 75% policy that other people, whether they be merchant solar plants, uh, such as are addressed with House Bill 4, and hopefully the Senate changes in it, or it be plants that are uh, operating as qualified facilities under PURPA, and we have several of those that are operating in the state, um, The utilities have no right to control access to the sun. And given their hostility to net metering and to rooftop solar, I think the idea that they should have a stake in 75% ownership of any solar that is built by anybody in Kentucky is asking a little bit much. Uh, Section 23 is of concern because it it moves away from the idea that any, any capital investment and construction other than in the ordinary course of business requires PSC approval to make sure it's needed, it's not wasteful, and it's least cost. It says that you can up to 3% of your net worth as a utility engage in new capital construction with no oversight. I'm sorry, but that would be up to, I think, $400 million for the combined LG&E and KU assets or somewhere near there. And I believe that the ratepayers have an expectation that any new capital construction is going to be subject to rigorous scrutiny under cross-examination with all of the stakeholders present to make sure that, in fact, whatever's being built is least cost and is used and useful. Um, Finally, the the, uh, lengthening tenfold, the length of new transmission line over 138 kV that would require PSC approval is of great concern. Uh, For those uh, who who are in rural areas where the co-ops are doing new transmission lines, they actively engage the public from day one in in this construction because they know in some cases they can be controversial. The reason that the CPCN requirement is in place now for these lines in the first place was because lg e wanted it some years ago. Apparently, minds have changed their, their opinion on whether they want the, the commission to review these, but I think the ratepayers have an expectation that any significant um, capital construction, including 138 kV lines that are not in the usual cor- course of service, are going to have scrutiny. And before they're required to pay the, the tab for them, that they will have some assurance that the commission has vetted it, that it is the least cost alternative, and that it's not wasteful duplication of existing lines that are out there. So happy to answer any questions. I look forward to this conversation, but I wanted to make clear that going into it, we are very concerned with the non-securitization parts of this bill. Thank you. And we do have a couple of quick questions, guys. We've got about six minutes to wrap up. Uh, Senator Williams, I'll yield to you first. Quick question. Um, on securitization, so one of the hesitancies that a utility has for putting 250 to 350 million into a coal plant to extend its life by adding scrubbers is the risk they may warrant that the feds are going to shut them down before the useful life. Could they, in fact, use securitization so that they could securitize that over a long term and mitigate the risk of short, shutting it down so that we could get scrubbers and extend the life? of these coal-fired power plants using securitization? Mm. 
maybe I hadn't seen it. Like I have to think about on a going forward, the question's going to be, all right, so you put a 30 year investment on a facility um, and then the thing shut well, down. Well, you're, you're gonna. Cause you're not gonna pay for that. You're not gonna pay for that. I mean, the, the problem ends up being in a lot of ways, what the investment is for the scrubber on top of the asset with its remaining useful life. So the problem ends up being right. If I'm going to run $300 million of cost over eight years, it's going to have a big customer hit. And so could you do that? And then could you securitize it once the thing were shut down? Maybe so. I think the question will be what, how the bond market will receive it. I've not seen it done before in these other states that have gone forth with securitization. I haven't seen it organized that way, but maybe. Thank you. Very good. And last we'll have is uh, Senator Webb. Just briefly, I appreciate you, Tom. I appreciate how you analyze things and how you inform us. And I appreciate our power companies. I, I always advocate on their behalf. However, as a former coal miner who, and my colleagues have heard this regularly, who built a solar home in 1981, I believe in diversification. But it in a, in a balanced energy policy that includes renewables and i feel a little validated as a psychic because for the last several decades i've said we wouldn't have that renewable policy till the utility companies owned it so uh <laughs> i feel a little validated there and i think we, as a former utiliz you, you know someone who has utilized solar in the past and hopes to in the future that particularly concerns me uh, so I think these issues will be brought forward. And also, Mr. Chairman, I think, you know, the Attorney General's Consumer Protection Division has always been uh, very valuable in, in formulating policy as well. So uh, at some point, we might want to bring them into the conversation. So thank you. All right. Very good, guys. We've run out of time. Thank you all for your input. Appreciate the sponsor bringing this today for discussion. You can tell it's a very, very big bill with a lot of history to it, and a lot of moving parts. We look forward to seeing what's next. But thank